to talk about uh, well relatively easy um, topic uh, for those who are really familiar with Spring Boot and implementing uh, services like microservices uh, with Spring Boot. And uh, often I see that uh, people um, sometimes do not use the full power of the uh, tools provided uh, f uh, not just for Spring Boot, but for uh, other um, frameworks. Uh, so the purpose of this uh, topic, today's discussion, is just to uh, talk a bit about the um, different way than we used to uh, have, uh, let's say, a couple of years ago. So in this today's agenda, okay, uh, so the second, it's just, okay. Uh, so what we are going to talk about is this, uh, about the API first approach and why do we need it? Uh, we'll briefly touch the open API and uh, generator for it. Uh, we'll try to set up project together with you uh, using open API generator specifically for the Spring um, Spring Boot. Uh, we will see how code generation works, and uh, I'll show you a, a small trick how we can uh, make the distributing of API specification uh, quite easily. And of course, we will run all of this and see how it works. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, then you can ask. Uh, so yeah, just don't hesitate to, to ask your questions. Okay, so uh, API first or last, right? So first of all, let's recall what is API. Uh, shorten API is just a contract between something which provides something, some services and consumer of these services. So it's supposed to uh, be a kind of a document which you can use just uh, not to make uh, a call to these services, but also implement those services. So this is, again, like a contract between uh, two parts. Uh, and this allows to make the systems modular, etc. So when we, uh, uh, okay, if if we have kind of a uh, task to implement some API between some uh, modules. So how this process looks like, right? So the typical scenario for this is uh, that solution is verbal described. Let's say we using, we working in Scrum process. And uh, first of all, we get in the task, we understanding what should we do Right, so it's getting discussed on some refinements, etc. And then usually developers they tend to start immediately doing something. So they just get an idea of what uh, needs to be done. If you're talking about the backend developers, right? Because uh, if we're talking uh, about the regular microservice microservices development, so it means that there must be some microservice, and there must be some consumer of this microservice, like other microservice or front end or whatever else. It might be asynchronous uh, calls. Uh, so a lot of ways to use this API we are going to implement. And uh, in this case, developer just starting creating some um, know, microservice skeletons, uh, some endpoints uh, service stops, etc. Uh, so they are just uh, starting uh, prototyping something, and then uh, when everything is created, uh, then the next uh, sub team, like front end developers or other microservice implementers, they might uh, start using them in their uh, 
uh, their own implementation. So usually I see that uh, people just implementing, mm, let's say some microservice and then uh, other people starting debugging these microservices uh, to see what calls uh, might be, uh, what calls uh, we need to use and uh, what request parameters we need to fill in, et cetera, et cetera. So this goes, as you can see, uh, like, um, in a loop, so developers doing something then realizes that, okay, they have missed something or front-end developers or other developers from other microservices just starts and giving their feedbacks, okay, that might, might be a better idea to, instead of passing, let's say this object, maybe let's enhance it, et cetera, et cetera. So this goes until everything settles down and uh, we have uh, agreed uh, all parts, right? Uh, we have tested our solution and it was finalized. And only after that, uh, suddenly uh, we need somehow <laughs> to create a specification. Of course, I'm not saying about 100% of projects uh, where this happens in exactly in this way. So there might be some better teams when, okay, so instead of just uh, trying um, our prototypes, let's uh, publish a Swagger file uh, from it uh, and uh, other front-end developers or um, other microservice uh, implementers, they might pick it up and use. However, uh, like I said, it always goes through the trial and errors phase. So despite even if we have at this moment API specification created, uh, it's not necessarily the final uh, version of the specification and during the implementation it might change. It's it's a normal process, right? However, this is uh, the <laughs> uh, process where API is like left, uh, API specification file is left uh, for the end. And I'm just uh, reminding that this API specification file is actually this, this document, which is supposed to be used like a contract between in the communication between uh, uh, provider and consumer. So if we're talking about an API first approach, it means that uh, instead of immediately once uh, we get in the task, instead of starting implementing our prototype, uh, starting implementing endpoints, models, etc. Uh, we are spending time on really docu documenting this uh, solution, this communication, and documenting uh, what uh, in point in points our uh, microservice or just regular service I will have, what models will be used, uh, what communication channels, what security uh, definition, etc. So instead of just leaving this till the end. Uh, we are starting our uh, implementation from the def definition of this uh, specification file. So uh, what benefits it brings? So first of all, um, this could be uh, working on this uh, API definition could be done uh, by some dedicated architectural team uh, who really knows uh, the domain model and uh, implements this uh, API specification, not implementing, but defining API specification, uh, like not knowing the details of uh, what framework, what language will be used to implement it. So it's kind of a uh, definition on high level, however, with uh, going deeper into details of these calls. So, uh, then this process turns into the way that uh, so solutions are really uh, refined before uh, it's presented to developers. So every single aspect of the future uh, API is uh, really thoroughly uh, discussed. And only after that, uh, this uh, API specification and design is presented to all the implementers of it. And as you can see, uh, having this API uh, specification file before the actual implementation, it allows 
to not depend on any of the implementers. So developers became developers, can start working on their part independently of uh, anyone others because uh, all the details are already agreed. So of course there is a still chance to get something modified, changed, but uh, in majority of the cases, uh, everything is really, really well known and uh, discussed. So it, it allows just developers to work on their parts, become developers work on their parts and perform their individual tests, relying on uh, some consumer uh, of uh, this uh, API. And uh, consumer of this API is like uh, implementers of front-end cl uh, client implementations can also make their work uh, independently. And even speaking of uh, the quality assurance part, uh, there is no need to wait for the actual implementation so they can then take a look at the um, running API or uh, just having the API specification uh, after the implementation is completed, then K can prepare um, implementing their case uh, test cases. And uh, while working in the parallel, uh, at the end, what we're doing, we're just uh, preparing integration testing. Uh, doesn't matter whether it, it's uh, on uh, on code side or just uh, manually tested. So we are testing all of this together and yeah, our project is done and it's really, um, fits the needs of the uh, initial uh, design in, uh, described in the API specification. So this this is how the typical API first scenario uh, looks like. Uh, so unlike the scenario where we are not really working on the API specification at the end, uh, at the beginning, uh, so we have all the details discussed and verified on the very beginning. So that's the benefit that, uh, well, you can even implement, uh, let's say, backend part, right? And you not really knowing who will be using it, etc. So you can leave it for for the later stages for someone else. Uh, so that that's the main benefit of this approach. Of course, there are many other benefits, uh, like standardization uh, of the uh, of the API design, etc but uh, the mo main and important part that uh, you really know well on what you I need what you need to implement so open api um, what is open api and why it's called so and why we uh, really want to use it so first of all uh, for those who uh, really familiar with Swagger. Uh, so um, Open API is like a descendant of this uh, project. So uh, it was uh, donated by uh, Swagger uh, company uh, just uh, to the open source community in 2015. Uh, and since that time, it uh, grown as a community-based project, which allows to standardize the REST, REST API documentation language and it make it really platform independent. So by having the uh, specification, API specification, and everything is uh, turned around either YAML file or JSON format. So once you have this, uh, specification uh, documented in either JSON or YAML format, uh, you can expect that the same, the implementation for it uh, could be implemented in any languages supporting it. And there are a lot of actually uh, languages supported, a lot of frameworks. So, um, so all about just to define it in the form of this JSON or YAML for format, and then somehow you have to implement it. So here becomes the problem. Okay, so this is an example of YAML file. We will be looking uh, 
closer to it uh, once we will take a look at the real um, demo of uh, this um, project. So typically it's just a regular YAML form format. However, is of, of course it has uh, predefined sections which you need to define uh, uh, in your uh, own API specification. And uh, so what to do next? Okay, we have YAML file. There are two ways. Either you uh, implemented it manually. Uh, we are defining, if you're talking about Spring Boot application, we are defining the uh, endpoint controllers, etc. cetera. Uh, so you can create these tabs uh, and uh, just uh, spend efforts on defining them according to specification. Or you can use uh, Open API Generator uh, so it's very uh, useful plugin, uh, which is uh, available for many languages. Actually, it supports many languages. You can see on the screen what languages, and currently we are interested in Java, and specifically in um, Spring. Uh, so this, there are a lot of uh, generators also available for some other frameworks. Uh, so. Uh, if you're working with some other uh, framework or language other than Java or Spring, of course, you can take a look at the official page of this generator and find out whether uh, there is something available for you. Right now, we are talking about Spring Boot and Java, of course. Then <laughs> we will uh, take a look at the example uh, for this specific uh, framework. So what it makes really nice. Uh, first of all, this is Maven plugin. However, it's not the only way how you can get the code generated. Uh, so you can use some kind of online generator. However, so far I've seen that it work with JSON format only. Uh, personally, I use always Maven plugin uh, for it. There is always Gradle plugin available. So um, what brings this uh, plugin? Why do we need it? As it says, it's generator. It's code generator. What it does, it generates for you these server stops. It can generate documentation, configuration, etc. So once you have your open API file defined, specification file defined, you just feed this file to this uh, plugin and it generates code for you. Of course, it does not generate your business logic behind of these endpoints, but what it does, it just minimizes your efforts into generating the controllers models, uh, also it takes care of the security components, etc. So a lot of things, it just uh, get rid, it just allows you to skip and do not uh, spend your time in first implementing them, second, uh, just uh, uh, spending efforts on testing them. And of course, it's not only about generating server service tabs, it also uh, generate clients. So uh, once again, if you have API definition for uh, some service, you can generate either a backend for it or you can generate a client for it. So it really simplifies uh, your life. And uh, what is great for it, despite its code generator inside of this plugin, you can make an influence on the process of generation because it uses uh, mustache templates uh, to generate the classes or any other uh, code. So by introducing changes, you can just specify where you want to define your own templates, you can uh, just uh, override the process of the code generation and uh, either enhance or adapt according to your needs. And uh, this plugin, despite it's mostly used as a Maven, it has a plugin available for the integration to Eclipse, uh, IntelliJ IDEA, Visual Studio and Studio Code. Uh, however, in our case, we will be looking at a Maven only, maybe plugin only. And it worth to mention that this open API generator is supported by a large variety of the companies. Uh, it's used by a large uh, number of companies and among them, 
uh, this so uh, well-known companies like Cisco, Oracle, Amazon Web Services, Twitter, X Twitter, now it's X. <laughs> Um, so uh, a lot of companies really working on this and once you start working with this uh, solution uh, I don't think that you ever would like to work in some other way rather than uh, really having the API specification first and then let this generator do uh, maybe half of the uh, half of the efforts uh, to generate the code so um, what do we need to, to have? So in order to uh, start using this um, open uh, API generator, we need to include the artifact uh, to our POM file. So we are describing this, uh, we, we are adding this dependency to list of dependencies, and then we are configuring the uh, plugin according to our needs uh, by specifying the path to the uh, API, API specification file. So as you can see, it's usually placed in the resources folder of your project. So there you place this API definition file and then at the uh, phase of the uh, code generation uh, of the Ma Ma Maven lifecycle, it also generates the code for you before the compilation uh, happens. So having this API specification uh, defined and uh, plugin used, uh, you will also save in space in your repository because you don't keep the models there, you don't keep the uh, controllers, stops, etc. So what you have in your project is just the plain implementation of the business logic you need to implement for your current task. So uh, later we will take a look uh, closer to this uh, to configuration of this plugin. So uh, as you can see here, the only downside of it that uh, we have to include this specification file in our uh, project uh, always in their sources. So if we need to adapt, uh, uh, update, specification file or change in it. Uh, so we will be needed always update it in our, uh, let's say implementation of this uh, microservices always. So it causes some um, inconveniences because uh, uh, you have to spread this file to uh, between all the microservices or services where this specification file must be used. So you're kind of duplicating it. And what to do is it? So there is um, uh, some kind of a way how to turn the uh, process of distributing API specification similar to what we use for the Maven dependencies. And uh, what we have to do is just to turn our uh, API the file uh, put into the dedicated repository, which uh, at the end will get, uh, so artifact will be produced in a form of jar file, which we can then include into our POM file as a regular dependency and just extract it into our target folder. So by having this, we will uh, deal with our uh, API repository in, in uh, like a regular project way so we can update its version and then what we will need to do uh, just to uh, update the uh, ver artifact version in the POM file for this dependency and it will automatically get extracted next time and uh, code will generate it from it and compile. So we will be looking at this example uh, I think right now. So that was kind of um, a preparation information for you uh, what we'll be uh, doing in our demo application. So let me switch to my uh, workspace. So here what I have prepared, I have prepared two uh, demo projects. So the first repository is the uh, repository where we will be keeping our definitions 
API specification definitions. Uh, so this uh, repository will contain just uh, all the references we will have to use for all of our microservices. So um, let's take a look at the first. So this one is kind of a dedicated for, let's say we have a couple of microservices. One of these uh, microservices is product microservice. So it dedicated to provide the details about the products in your system, create products, et cetera, et cetera. So the other microservices would be some other kind of allowing to order these products, pay for these products, etc. So they would have their own API definitions. And what makes this really important is just to have in the API specification file a defined path, our endpoints, what uh, which we uh, will need to implement and support. So uh, we won't dig into the details of the API. Um, this open API uh, definition file. So you can uh, take a look at them at the official uh, site. Actually, it comes from the Swagger uh, site. So those who are familiar with Swagger, you may be already aware of it because as I said, uh, uh, the Swagger API definition file was uh, donated to, uh, to become as a basis for the open API definition. So, um, you can take a look at what parts it consists. But briefly, we can uh, take a look at uh, these parts. So as usually, that's a description of this definition, uh, the purpose of it, the version of it. Um, there is a kind of tag, service, etc. We won't touch this. So uh, it allows you to define tags for the operations and uh, packages, etc. So um, here, uh, what is really important in this file is to uh, define our endpoints. And since we are building a RESTful application, RESTful uh, system, so of course, so the most appropriate way to describe uh, REST endpoints. However, it does not force you to work with a RESTful model only. Uh, if you don't follow completely RESTful approach, you can just use it describing your own uh, own endpoints because uh, basically it works around an HTTP uh, requests and so on and uh, most of them are really uh, common. So let's review what uh, we have here. So it's an easy get uh, call uh, for the products to get it by ID. Uh, so it returns the details of these products. And uh, here we are defining the parameters and you can see these parameters are in the path of this endpoint. There's other options to have parameters in headers as well. So you can read the values from the headers of the requests. And sometimes it's very uh, useful, especially when you are dealing with some token authorization, etc. So you can um, refer to the values sent in the uh, header. Uh, so this endpoint also defines the kind of responses we are going to return. So you can see that there are a couple of um, predefined uh, response types. So uh, since this is the text uh, content of this file, you can um, well you can follow uh, the predefined uh, standards of defining of this uh, like status etc. So you can see you can use either a text uh, format or or just uh, numbers in it. So uh, here we are defining what our endpoint is going to uh, return. And here you can see that uh, we can refer to the some object um, and it in the form of the JSON file, right? So this object uh, in the form of JSON will be returned. And uh, here we can see that, I'm sorry, so in the components, uh, we are really defining in the section of components, we're defining the schemas for our uh, returning type. It's not just a returning type, this is the model definition 
which might be used either as a response, as part of response or as part of request. Here in this example, I have uh, created another endpoint for the post operation to create a product. So, uh, and as you can see what makes different that here we also uh, defining what will be a part of the request body since this is a post request, right? So we have to include something in the request. And here we are defining what we are going to include uh, in the form of JSON format in the request. And as you can see, we are also including the product model. So uh, it's uh, actually a, <laughs> a normal process where we, uh, if we want to create the product, we are including the full, full model of this product to be persisted or what, whatever uh, processed. So here we are defining the model of it. So uh, despite, so, uh, what is important to mention that uh, actually open API definition supports couple of um, embedded data types. So this might be string, integer. Um, there are just about five or six embedded types. And of course we need much more, especially considering when we want to define our own model and this done through the uh, definition type object. And here we define that, okay, our product is, uh, contains these properties. It might, con it uh, should contain ID of type string. Uh, so this property read only says that, okay, this property, you can treat it like a response model only. Uh, so it means that uh, when you're making a calls requests, uh, this property could be omitted. Uh, you don't have to specify it. However, um, backend must always provide value for it. So, uh, and usually when you are creating an ID, uh, creating a product, right? You don't have an ID yet assigned. So that's a part of the backend to assign an ID to it. So uh, there are a lot of uh, other properties of this model. So I just encourage you just to take a look at the open API specification file to see what uh, what you have to do, what you can do with it. And you also can use uh, an extension of the existing models. However, it's a bit tricky, uh, but um, it allows you to just uh, use inheritance of the models, etc. So at the end, you will get the model uh, like uh, extending some other models with predefined uh, fields in these uh, properties in these classes uh, for the de definition in this uh, YAML file. So um, also it can, uh, we can include other models, right? So it's just uh, uh, like you uh, defining uh, your class, uh, your model, in your normal project. However, in a form of the text definition of it. And again, since this is a language agnostic format, uh, you don't know what the final uh, implementation, what the language and framework will be using it. So that's why um, there is just not too much uh, predefined types. And most of the time you would need just to define your own types uh, through the model definitions. But that's okay because you then you have a flexibility to generate this uh, not for just Java, but for example, for the front end, right? So having this API definition file, you can uh, let your front end to generate the steps for you, the client for you. Okay, so uh, again, so this uh, section in this file uh, is dedicated just to define the uh, models we are going to use either in requests or responses in our microservices, in, in our endpoints. And what it's important to mention that you don't have to define these models exactly in the same file dedicated just for your uh, microservice or whatever API you're implementing. So this, a definition could be moved to some, let's say, shared files. So there is a way to refer definitions from some other files, like in this example. So I moved uh, the, let's say, bad request models um, 
to a shared models file. So it's basically the same. It just keeps the uh, definitions of the uh, models, uh, which should be used uh, across several um, microservices uh, or um, API implementations. So you don't have to copy these definitions from file to file. Uh, you just move it just to a shared file and then refer to it from the uh, your dedicated uh, API specification file. So by having this, you don't, again, don't duplicate and you always have up to date the uh, model uh, according to the version of your uh, API definition. So that's what we have in this YAML file. Of course, that does not cover even the third of the possibilities of this uh, open, uh, specify, uh, open API specification format. Uh, so just take a look to, because uh, we won't be able to go through all of these properties and I don't think that we should do this. So once we have defined these uh, endpoints and models, the next part would be just to produce the regular uh, jar file from it and put it to some um, artifactory or whatever uh, whatever um, system you use to keep your artifacts. It might be GitHub packages. It might be, like I said, artifactory or whatever you use. So the repository where you keep your uh, art build artifacts. So after that, it will stay there in a form of jar file. So at the later step, when we want to uh, use this model, then in our dedicated uh, API implementation, what we're going to use is just to uh, extract this jar file with the help of that plugin I shown you previously. So this is that plugin, what it does. It impacts, so it fetches our artifact, keeping the API specifications, uh, of, of course, uh, of the defined versions. And what it does, it just extracts these uh, files into our output directory. So usually this is the target directory. I'm sorry, I'm still on the call. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so uh, after that, uh, when this uh, jar file is extracted, then we have uh, only those files we are really looking at. So this jar file usually contains all the API definitions for all your microservices. And uh, when you're implementing your own dedicated microservice, in our case, this is product microservice, uh, we don't have, we don't want to load any other spe API specifications file except of those we are working with right now. In, in our case, I have defined this in the, in these uh, properties. So it open API uh, specification file, where is it? Maven generator. Okay, this one, right? So that's the name of the file we are looking at. And this is exactly that file we have reviewed previously. So then life becomes easier. So you, all, you already have uh, this file extracted and uh, this API specification files are placed to the target folder. And then in your uh, Maven generator plugin, you can uh, refer to it through the uh, this reference for these uh, properties. So that's how it makes life easier. You don't have to copy this API specification file over and over to your projects. What you have to do is once define what file you will be working with. And then if you introduce any changes to your API definition file, you just update the version and it will get extracted again and code will be generated from, from it. So um, let's quickly take a look how this uh, this plugin is configured. So basically, um, again, this is a very powerful plugin. Uh, like I said, it allows you to uh, 
make custom uh, generated files, even use custom generators, etc. So it's worth to take a look at the official page of this uh, open by generator. It explains a lot of configuration options. However, what are really important uh, I mentioned here. So this is the file which will be used to generate a, a code. Uh, this is the type of generator. In our case, this is Spring Boot or just a regular Spring generator. It will generate endpoints in the form of controls for you. Uh, this is the reference to the API package where you uh, want to place your API generated files like controllers, etc. And this is, you can have uh, a separate uh, package where you want to put your models, model definitions. And since you usually work with one uh, version of your API specification, however, if you in um, transition from one version of a, your API to another one. Let's say you have worked on the version one of your API and then uh, the new API version two was introduced and you uh, forced to uh, work in a parallel, have uh, to, to, to support the uh, outdated version of API for some period of time, then uh, you can work with both definitions here. You just need to define another execution uh, and uh, point it to for the API specification file for the old version. But the problem is that if you put them all in one uh, packages, then uh, this uh, the same named files will override each other. So that's why you can put uh, files into separate uh, packages. And just excuse me. I'm back. Um, I didn't click the correct button. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was supposed to mute. Um, okay, so uh, what uh, I want to say that uh, by having this uh, as many executions as you need, you can generate uh, classes for different versions of your API. And what is really nice for this uh, this generator, this plugin, that it, you can reuse uh, generated classes from one version in generated classes of the, the 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 other version, the next version. So this can be used with the import mappings. So uh, here you specify, I just commented it out just for sake of the example, uh, but later I will come the comment it uh, and comment. So um, you can specify which uh, model you want to replace with the some other model. In my example, I just created an extended version of one of my models, so product variant, um, just because uh, I want my API implementation work not with the standard defined product variant, but with some other extended version. And what is nice, maybe not always nice, but uh, it's still a possibility, you can specify what exactly the type of the uh, classes your generated core code should refer to. These classes might be completely incompatible with what specification uh, says. Of course, that's a better idea, but again, this is still a possibility. So you have a way just to redefine uh, the cl generated classes and instead of asking to generate files uh, for all of your implementations, you can just reuse from some of your uh, predefined models. So that's still a possibility. And uh, okay, we almost, I don't know if we are running out of time. So I just want to quickly explain these options. So, uh, here is a configuration options, which uh, drives the way how the code is generated. And what is commonly used is the delegate pattern. What does it mean? It means that uh, it will generate controllers for you, but you don't have to, but you still need to implement your functionality and business logic. So instead of just implementing your controller, it creates a delegate for you uh, the interface of delegate, uh, 
so the controller calls this delegate and what you need to do is just to implement this delegate. So in this delegate, you don't deal with any request models, etc., definitions. So everything uh, is left behind the scenes. So in your implementation, you just implement a regular service and working with the models like uh, regular parameters of the methods. So it's very useful uh, feature just to generate the code in delegate part and way. Otherwise, it will generate for you just a regular controller. So, uh, so you will need just to uh, work with, uh, uh, with the implementation of this controller on your own. So, OK. Um, enough uh, just introduction. Let's maybe um, do something. So I already generated the jar file for it. And it stays in my local Maven repository. Uh, so let's quickly uh, clean the project. So uh, I'll just show you that my workspace uh, does not contain anything in it. And you can see that uh, this folder is empty. And immediately, uh, since I'm referring to uh, some generated code, uh, code starts uh, failing. So let's uh, execute the generator. So again, this is one of the phases of Maven build process. So I'm executing the Maven build. And let's see what we have uh, in the console. So what it does, uh, it generated for us files, right? So it generated these models, it generated controller and the uh, delegate. And after that, it just compiled all those files like it belongs to your code base. So let's refresh our project and we will see that, okay, this open generator will uh, just generate it for you controllers. Let's take a look quickly what inside of this generated uh, class. So this is the implementation of, of the controller. Uh, and this is the interface of it. So it annotates everything with what we have uh, defined in our spe API specification file. Uh, so this is Swagger annotations, and it means that uh, once you uh, use some tool uh, from the Swagger package, which is supposed to detect uh, endpoints and provide, again, generate uh, an API documentation for it. So it will, uh, it will be possible to do. Uh, but what is important, it just creates for you all of these uh, endpoints, uh, controllers, and generates also models. Right, this is our product. And as you can see, uh, this is exactly what we have uh, specified in our uh, definition file. Uh, it has a list of product variants and product variant was generated as well. So um, we, did, we didn't spend any efforts on generating these uh, models, uh, controllers. Of course, this is one simple uh, example where we have one simple uh, endpoint uh, is just a tiny model. But if your project is quite large and microservices sometimes tend to grow, uh, then uh, much more models uh, will be defined. And especially if you're using the shared models. In our case, these models are not shared. They are defined in dedicated open API specification file. However, if you are writing a client for some microservice or you are using some models from other microservices, for example, in a synchronous way, uh, then you would need to have these models defined in your microservice you're implementing as well. So for example, uh, let's say payment microservice. So the pay payment for the product. So in order to pay for the product, you have to uh, define the 
same product model and it's already defined in product microservice. So what you do, you, ju you just uh, include the API definition file. Of course, the, uh, if the model is used more in one project uh, in my microservice, then it's uh, worth to be put in the shared uh, YAML file. So in this case, you will have all the mod models are already available for you. So you don't have to spend efforts on defining these detail files, model files in your uh, microservice you're working on uh, and to just use in your uh, logic. So this plugin generated for you this controller. And as we already looked at, it cre created delegate for you. So instead of implementing the controller like it was done here, right? So this is implements, uh, this controller implements our API. So what it does, it just delegates the uh, calls to this delegate. And this delegate is another interface. And here, this is what we need to implement. It still has kind of the um, Java docs of what endpoints this particular method is um, is dedicated for. Uh, so still what you need to do is just to implement this interface. And what is really cool, uh, sometimes you, if you don't want to implement yet uh, some endpoint or you don't have the time for it yet, you just want to have kind of a stop, uh, it will do it for you. So for these calls where you create the product, uh, so it will uh, throw the not, not implemented. So again, you won't have the 404, you won't have uh, not found, you will have something which is really um, responding, right? So you know for sure that you are calling a correct path uh, for the endpoint. Or it might even produce for you uh, some um, mock representation and the value for this mock representation is taken from the examples defined in the uh, specification file. And again, it will uh, throw the not implemented, right? So um, again, uh, once you have generated this delegate, the next part for you would be just to go and implement it. And this, this is what we are doing in our uh, our, our implementation of it, you have just to implement that delegate uh, and in, invoke your business logic and include uh, some other spring bins here and just implement your regular business logic here. Uh, here I just <laughs> defined sample uh, returns. There is no intention to show any business logics or so. Uh, the main intention just to show how it gets simplified once you have an API specification file defined before your actual implementation. And in a matter of just uh, maybe up to one hour, you can have the code generator for you and you can even deploy it and ask, uh, let QA team start working on the uh, test case implementation, preparing some uh, Postman collections for it, et cetera. So it's really a speed ups the process. Um, yeah, Roman, you wanted to ask something? Yeah, I'd like to ask if we don't add this delegate to configuration, we should implement our controllers ourselves. How can we do it if the classes are added to target file, not in source file, uh, source folder, I mean. So. But our API delegate is also in target folder, right? And we are implementing. Yeah, it's interface, and we should implement it. Yeah. Yeah. So and controller. how can we uh, add changes to generated file if we need to add logic ourselves? So in this case, you won't get the API controller generated for you. You will get just product API. This is an interface which will stay oh. in target folder, and you will have to oh. implement this controller in your source folder. Ah, oh, okay. I see. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, any other questions so far? Oh, hi, Andre. <clears throat> oh. Uh, could you please show me again all hierarchy of this controller starting from its interface? Yeah, this is the top level. 
okay, it's a top level, it's our interface uh, and uh, our controller implements this interface. Exactly. And uh, passes all business logic to delegate. Well, so, the calls calls to to business logic okay. passes to our delegates. Uh, so uh, this control it looks like just intermediate layer. Am I exactly. right? Exactly, exactly, and it works with the high level uh, of this. Uh, let, let's say, uh, so it has the uh, the possibility to trigger the validation uh, logic. Right. So in our API definition file, I didn't mention that, but there is a way just to specify what is required, what is or not. So this controller will handle this uh, validation logic for you, so you don't have to worry about it. And you, in your delegate, you'll get already validated uh, models. Ah, so inside controller we have validation which is separated from business logic from exactly. uh, ah, yes. so we don't need to remove this intermediate layer after our all our development uh completes we don't have to because this is a part of our thread our uh, running thread so controllers still the first uh, points where we are receiving the requests so controllers must have we don't we cannot oh. get rid of them right but what we can uh, leave for this uh, generator is just to do this some kind of intermediate work like defining this map mappings uh, and triggering the validation logics uh, like i mentioned there is also some security stuff we can define additionally so everything is done by this uh, generator. It just creates for you the implementation of this controller and passes to you already validated, already prepared object to your business logic, to your bin implementing your business logic. Uh, because we usually uh, combine controller and delegate implement implementation. Exactly, yes, yes. Uh -huh. and, and by using this delegate pattern, we can uh, split this into the dedicated uh, components. The oh, first yeah. high-level component working with request and validating it. And second is our just regular service implementation. Oh, really good approach. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, any other questions? Because I want just yeah, to just come... one yeah. more. Is it possible that the delegate will not use a response entity? So it will be like a clean service without any web uh, dependencies on it because we get the input input like a regular POJO as we but we need to provide a response entity which is already a web layer I guess is it possible to configure that the delegate will only work with simple POJOs like product we need to return only product and the controller will take care of of wrapping it around in the response entity. Uh, when it comes to delegate, I'm afraid not, because mm -hmm. it's still a delegate, but it's still uh, focused on the web layer, right? But what you can do, you can define your own services, right? Your own bin, strictly working with just the Podge, uh, returning just the model, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, just call it within this delegate uh, through the regular bin usage, and that's it. Okay. So yeah, despite it's a kind of a service, it's still a part of the web layer. So it has to work with response entity in some other way, whether returning a product or void response. But uh, that's how the delegate. It's not the lower layer, right? It's the same web layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought maybe it, it's possible to mm -hmm. add. Configuration stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, shall I continue? Okay. So once we have defined uh, our delegate, then uh, I mean implemented it, then that's it. So what you what would the next what we do? We just uh, let's launch this uh, application. It's just an easy one. And let's hope that we didn't break anything. Uh, 
during the uh, session. So I'm launching this Spring Boot application. And uh, for the sake of sim simplicity, uh, I'll use Postman to make a call to it. So yeah, it started already and I have already uh, defined an endpoint in uh, Postman. So this is our endpoint, which is supposed to uh, return get response. Uh, so this is the name of the product we want to get details for. And according to our implementation, I will use this product ID. So again, this is what we are looking for. So I'll return this uh, product ID in the ID field of the product. So this is another mock returned, um, but let's let's see what it returns. So I'm clicking on send. First of all, we don't use any authorizations. We don't use custom headers. Of course, body is, <laughs> is empty because this is get. And let's cl click on send. And what we have returned, we have returned the body of our request. First of all, this is a response. Uh, this is 200 response. So it means that all is good. So we have returned back uh, the product name we specified in the name. And this is our model. And this is the category which not falls into the regular um, definition. So this is what I mentioned that we want sometimes to extend or completely replace the return model. So, um, okay, maybe this, no. Okay, so uh, if we take a look at the product variant, so we have defined only ID, name, and descriptions fields, but this is the category, this is the some other uh, field which we have I defined in our own uh, model. So it's not from the generated. This is our, uh, this is some other variant which we using uh, like extending of the product variant, which again comes from the target folder. And here we are, we have defined this category field. So nothing special, right? But, uh, and we are returning the extended product variant. So why do we have to use these imports like I shown previously? And the reason for it that uh, Despite you do this, uh, this is a normal operation where you are uh, uh, returning the, let's say, wider object than the originally uh, we supposed to return. Uh, so due to inheritance, etc. But uh, you are not really forcing your uh, API implementation to work exactly with this model. And uh, you can also define this uh, model you want to uh, include in your request, uh, let's say from other uh, library, uh, jar file, etc. cetera. So, uh, so by forcing, in order to force your implementation to work exactly this, this model, uh, we can say this via the configuration in uh, POM file. So this is this import mappings, mappings do. So let's uh, uncomment this. So what I'm saying, okay, in all classes, in all API implementations, do not work with the product variant defined in the original API definition file, just work with the some other model, which I'm specifying uh, here. And let's then generate our classes now. Let's first clean. And then let's generate again. Okay, again, uh, these classes are not referring to the exact, um, to our models in the uh, target folder. So classes are generated, despite completion is not completed, but again. So let's take a look at our uh, what we have generated. So model, uh, as, you, as you probably remember, the model is, a, uh, the product variant is a part of product, right? So product contains a list of product variants. So let's take a look at what we have defined here. As, and now you can see that we are forced 
in our implementation in all the products include our changed model. So um, by, by having this, we can like substitute something which was originally uh, specified in the uh, original API specification. So this allows to have the flexibility in the model definition. And uh, so right now, the, uh, the returned, if we take a look at our extended product variant, we have defined the additional category. So now it becomes obligatory to our implementation. So it no longer can return just product variant it must always return this extended product variant in our products. Of course, it does not change the response of our endpoints because in either way, uh, this category was returned, right? But if we really want to limit our implementations to work exactly with this model or completely replace it with something really different, then we can do this with usage of these import mappings. And again, I mentioned that we might have several API implementations, several versions of API implementation running in parallel. And sometimes we don't want to have a lot of models because these models might be used in some mappers, etc. And we don't want to uh, duplicate those uh, classes relying on these models. So if those models are identical, so what is the point to have a couple of models? So then uh, these import mappings becomes handy because we can point, let's say, an older implementation working with the models from the newer implementation. And this will work perfectly. So a lot of ways uh, how it can becomes handy. Uh, so again, encourage you to read the um, documentation of this Open API specification first and uh, Open API generator second, and this will allow to you to build a rich applications uh, from the already available API definition file quickly. And what is really important. Uh, really matching the API specification. So if there is no uh, way that you make a mistake in the implementation, incorrectly implementing this API design. I believe that's it what I wanted to show you today. Um, you, do you have any additional questions? Yeah, we have Danilo, please. Yeah. Hello. Uh, regarding the last point, so imagine we extended the product variant, right? And mm -hmm. we have response with, let's say, three additional fields. Mm -hmm. But our clients, they depend on the original open API spec, right? So what's the point if the client does not know from the spec that there will be more fields? Okay. First of all, let's talk about the breaking design non-breaking design, right? So it means that once you define this uh, specification of your API endpoint, you have to support it uh, in this, your current version. So as long as you're working in your, let's say the version one, you have to support and you have no chance, you are not allowed to reduce the amount of data uh, you're sending. But, but uh, if you uh, are enhancing your models, endpoints, etc., you are not really breaking anything because you're just adding new. You don't uh, decrease the data. You don't modify. Well, actually, you might modify the business logic behind of this uh, API calls. However, you most of the time you are enhancing, and once you are enhancing you are not breaking, then you are allowed to enhance your models with some new data, which is not described. However, you might be uh, aware of them as a consumer of this uh, with in your um, 
I don't know, maybe your own microservice. So this API file uh, describes model not just to be returned via the regular um, HTTP request. It might be reused in your own application in some event-driven uh, services, etc. So you might uh, add more details to your object, which are not really a part of the specification because you're just aware of it. And despite it not look like um, a good explanation of it, I mean that uh, I agree that what's the point to provide more details than they are defined here. However, um, what you can do, you can replace the logic of the, okay, so this is the plain Poggio file, but imagine what if you have in this, it's not a, just a model, it's just some uh, class which has some additional logic behind of it. What if we want to do some calculations based on the data inside of the parent? So for example, uh, what if description depends of the, on the name, right? So in this just dictates the uh, original uh, API design uh, of this model. But what if we want to include some logic which will, let's say, create a description based on the name of it, for example, or we want to include some calculations like price of something, right? Of course, that becomes not a regular Poggio, but I never said that it's supposed to be a regular Poggio. This is a, an object, this is a model, and it might contain something tricky dedicated to work with your uh, specific models. Uh, and for example, what if uh, you, you have an already available services which knows how to work with, let's say, product variant two, right? Uh, but it completely exactly the same structure. So your API design dictates that you have to accept product variant, but you have a service accepting product variant two and it also has exactly the same fields. So what is the, so then you would need just to copy the data from the product variant and pass it uh, and construct the product variant too and pass it to your already available services. But instead of that, you are just declaring, okay, I know what I'm doing. Instead of constructing the product variant from the open API file, since it's fully compliant with my own product variant implementation, please construct me product having not the regular product variants, but my own product variants. And then I will be able immediately pass the data from this, uh, from these models to some already available services. So 